So we have something a little bit different today, but not too far from home. This is the DHC3 Otter from Milvis. But this is no ordinary Otter, this is an Otter equipped with a PT6 turboprop engine. Now de Havilland Canada didn't actually make a turbine equipped Otter, you couldn't buy one from them. Although curiously enough they did experiment in the 1960s with an Otter that had a jet engine mounted mid fuselage in addition to the R1340 radial engine up front and that jet engine was designed to provide vectored thrust really to support exper de Havilland's experiments in super stall performance that short takeoff and landing performance and in fact in its final configuration that testbed aircraft actually had three engines it had the fuselage mounted jet engine and it also had two PT6 turboprops mounted on the wings replacing the radial engine up front and of course that configuration foreshadowed the general layout and appearance of the DHC6 Twin Otter. Now in about 1970 or 71 de Havilland did in fact design a factory conversion to use a PT6 turboprop but it was going to be very expensive indeed the PT6 engine alone cost almost as much as the radial equipped and the complete <laughs> THC3 so so they never put that into production but there were a number of independent developments of conversions over the years and so there are quite a lot of turbine equipped DHC3s out there in the field. So this one by Milvis is based on obviously their existing DHC3 Otter aircraft and what they've done here is they've modelled a kind of a generic fictional really variant of the PT6 equipped Otter based around a PT6 34 variant. You can look up the specs, the, the power ratings and so on for yourself but in broad terms what that gives you of the original DHC3 is, I mean you've got an engine that weighs about 30% of what the radial engine weighs. It produces maybe twice as much power and you know, much lower maintenance, higher reliability, availability of jet fuel increasingly and, and so on but uh, and of course there were engineering challenges you know taking all that weight off the front really screws up the center of gravity so they had to play with the sighting of the fuel tanks you know addition of ballast and, and all sorts so a great engineering feat in itself you can read about all this I, d I do recommend a book by I think it's Sean Rossiter and that's the Otter and Twin Otter Universal Airplanes that's called uh, so you can read all about the the, de the ins and outs of the development of the Otter, including something about the turboprop conversions. So we're going to take an introductory look at this aircraft today. So I'll be flying it from my hardware cockpit today. It doesn't quite fit my hardware, obviously this is designed around the Twin Otter, but it's close enough. I've done all the plumbing and I've got pretty much everything I need to fly this around routinely, including full GPS radio controls and complete autopilot. I have to say due credit to Milvis for making all of that very accessible. They actually list, I don't know if it's quite comprehensive, but they list many of the LVARs that they've exposed specifically to allow you to control aspects of the aircraft systems and that includes a complete list for the autopilot. So that made setting up the autopilot absolutely straightforward. Using, I'm using Linda as always with Lua but I mean you can do that with raw Lua scripts from FSU IPC if you don't use Linda. So all credit to Milvis for that. You do actually get the Milvis Rex weather radar product included with this. I haven't tried that out yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying that out. I was going to buy that for the Twin Otter. And, uh, and this is locked, this version is locked to the to the Otter. So I, if I want it for the Twin Otter I'll, I will have to buy that separately. But this will let me um, try it out. I do hope that we'll find a list of LVARs to control that as well. I do already have a panel for the, well, a different weather radar. I bought the Reality XP one, which is a bit rubbish, to be honest. So I'll be using my hardware panel, but I'll fly this from the virtual cockpit so you can see everything that's going on. And we're just going to jump in, take, a, I suppose, an overview of the aircraft, and no doubt we'll get onto some more specifics in some future videos. So I'll get set up 
and see you there. Okay, so here we are in the cockpit. I'm not going to do everything in great detail here. I'm not going to go through the startup particularly or all the switches. There's an, a couple of YouTube videos that do that already and a couple of them are pretty good, pretty comprehensive, so you can find that out. Just, you may be familiar with the, I haven't got the original DHC3 so I can't really compare it to that. But just comparing with the Twin Otter, you know, basically the engine startup at least is pretty similar to the Twin Otter. And you know it's fairly easy to start as long as you do all the steps in the right order. There's only a couple of steps. One, one difference I'll just point out, there's a, there's a light, if you look right in the centre there, called P3 heater. There's a thing that the Twin Otter doesn't have which is called a P3 heater that needs to be on during the startup procedure and then left on for flight. Now I'm not really sure what that is. The P3 line is a, is a sensing light, a bleed air tap if you like from one of the compressor stages and it feeds into, and it's a, it's a sensor, and it feeds into the fuel control unit and the constant speed prop. I don't know why it needs a heater, I have an idea, maybe that's about ensuring that there's a baseline air density or something to the measurement. So anyway, that needs to be on for the startup. The light goes out when you turn it on. I've got everything here that I need on switches in my hardware cockpit, by the way, and that makes things much more realistic and usable. So. Just one other thing I wanted to show you before we start up, turn the avionics on and if you look over to the right everything comes on, if we just wait a second we've got one, you can configure this avionics display, we've got one GNS530 and this is the Reality XP version you can use the default and you can use various other products, you can put the GTN 650 or 750 in, you can use products from Flight One, but I have the RXP GNS 530. There's also a 430 next to it which I've got it configured not to use so you can use two at a time and I'm just initialising that now. Now I'm just showing you here there's something wrong with that GNS 530 display. It's truncated and I was going to say that's a rough edge. It's debatable whether it's a rough edge. What's going on there is I run my GNS 530 on an external monitor I have built my own GPS control panel and I use an option called no bezel which the RXP version 2 allows you to basically run just the screen part of the, the display without the buttons and knobs. Now the Milvis model doesn't know about that so so then it, it displays it too big and crops the edges off. So if I just fix that to show you it can be fixed before we continue the reality xp gns.ini file no bezel equals true change that to false and if we reload the aircraft you should see we've now got the complete gns 530 displayed correctly. So that's just something to be aware of. You might think that's broken when you first try it out. Um, so let's just get this thing started. We can instantly hide the yoke by clicking on it, which we will do. Now although we've got the avionics down here, in particular the GPS and the autopilot, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring up the autopilot on a 2D panel as well just because it's easier to work with and we can keep sight of it. Now there's something blinking there. We need to keep the autopilot's pressure setting synchronized with the pressure setting we've got on the altimeter. That's currently well in fact let's get the ATIS and set that correctly. Kilo 
Romeo Ango, X-ray, airport information, Alpha 1338, Zulu, weather, wind, call, visibility 10, sky clear, temperature 4, new point 3, altimeter 2, 2990, so we're almost, that's what, pretty much is what's set. So we just have to change that on the autopilot to match. And we do that by pressing the barrel button and then we can just dial it in on the rotary knob. That shows us we're at 700 feet, which is pretty much, well, we're, we're looking at 630 feet on the altimeter. But uh, that's close enough. So let's taxi out and see what we can see. Now before we taxi out we've got to unlock the tail wheel. This is a tail wheel aircraft, don't forget. We've got three positions for the tail wheel. I'm trying to show you the indicator and the switch in there. We've got a three position switch. Um, in the central position the tail wheel is locked. There's an indicator for that. We need that for takeoff and landing. On the ground we've got proper electrical steering that follows the rudder. There's also a free cast rig setting, which we're not going to use. So we want ground steering for now. And we should be able to taxi out. Parking brake off. So we centre up, put the parking brake back on, and now we want to lock the tail wheel. That avoids us getting too squirrely as we go. Now what we're looking for here, one of the things that we're really interested in with this aircraft is how it models the performance of the PT-6 turboprop. Now I don't really mean whether it flies by the numbers on the gauges, although that's important I guess if you want to fly it by the book. Really it's the feel, the responsiveness, the prepared an FSX traditional PT-6 or turboprop model is lamentably sluggish and it's not much different to flying a turbine, um, I mean a turbine jet. One of the reasons we have a turboprop is we retain some of the benefits or the major benefits of the propeller which is we get a fast response, uh, well that really. Uh, but we have the re reliability of the turbine engine driving it. So we're going to see how that plays out as we go. Let's put some flaps down. You might just see there's a flap indicator just underneath the compass towards the middle of the cockpit. We've got a lot of flaps. Now this is not done electrically in the DHC-3 can we see, is that the flap lever, I think that's the flap lever over there, I can't really get tight with my track high up, but we're just, we've just got it on a switch, so, um, so we set take off flaps, we need to get the elevator trim set for takeoff, there's an indicator down there, that's set pretty much for takeoff. So let's go. Now don't forget we can't just ram this power lever to the firewall. I'm watching the torque gauge, we want to make sure we keep it well within the green. Otherwise we're going to blow up the engine and trust me, that happens. So I'm going to let the brakes go, oh, there you go. <laughs> I told you, I don't know why, why it happened exactly there, but that's what's going to happen if you jump in this aircraft and just try and fly it around. You might get it off the ground, you'll find it tricky to land smoothly, you're going to think the autopilot's broken and you're probably going to blow up the engine sooner or later, sooner in this case. So take two, ready to go, try and make a better effort this time. Everything is in the green. Outside air temperature is about 12 degrees Celsius. Uh, make sure we've got the tailwheel locked. 
we do. Flaps are set. I'm going to open that power lever a little bit more cautiously. Parking brake is off, holding the brakes. We've got a 40 psi with the torque, I think, and we'll take off with that. No wind here, so we should. Shouldn't have any problems keeping it straight. Oop. Kind of bouncy but very quickly off the ground. The reason I was bouncing there, you need a lot of back pressure to take off. It wants a very nose down attitude with the takeoff trim and the takeoff flap setting. There it is. I wanted to uh, I need to trim up just to get us get the climb going that glitching is my speaker volume control it's not the aircraft let's take in a bit of the flaps go up to the climb setting Now bring the prop back a little bit, put us in the green arc. Maybe stay kind of low, do a little bit of sightseeing. We'll just fly up this valley. We're going to look at Barrow Field 30 OR, which is very close to this. This is 05S Vernonia, an orbic strip. Um, we're not going to try and put this down at Barrow Field because it's a very, very short field indeed. And we're probably going to. We wouldn't. We wouldn't make it at my level of experience with this aircraft to date. So what can we, what can we do? Let's go. In fact, let's go up a little bit. Let's just, we'll go to autopilot, we'll just say a little, little bit about the autopilot. Which is kind of something that takes a little bit of getting used to because it doesn't behave like you might expect it to do. It behaves, some of the functions, we we'll just go on, we'll autopilot, in fact you might first of all think the autopilot doesn't work. You have to press and hold the on button before it comes on. So I'll do that. So we're by default we're in roll mode which means keeps the wings level and we're in vertical speed mode. If I press the up or down button or press the up button that dials it in an 800 feet per minute climb which you should see, should see reflected on the vertical speed indicator we will go up 900,000 so we should be creeping up to a thousand feet per minute in the climb next thing we can do is you can use heading mode uh, we move the heading bug around on the gyro compass or the direction indicator and select heading mode so that replaces the roll mode we're now going to follow the, the heading bug I'm not paying attention about where we are now, Barrow Field's not on the GPS, so there's no good looking for it on there. Let's just, again with the autopilot, select altitude hold mode. That's just going to capture the current altitude, which is just coming up 5,000 feet. And it's going to hold us there, as you'd expect. I'm going to get the flaps all in now.
Okay, I wasn't paying attention there, so I, I've kind of lost my spatial awareness now. If we turn around and go back. We'll talk about the fuel systems in a moment. Well, we'll talk, maybe we'll talk about the fuel systems now. This aircraft has three fuel tanks. They're all in the fuselage, no tanks in the wings. And the way the fuel is routed to the engine is a little bit, a little bit peculiar. It only feeds from the centre tank into the engine. If we look at the, the gauges over here right in the centre of the screen, uh, I've actually got a fuel control panel of my own that I built. So I can just, if I vary this, the levels in, in those tanks, you just see the needles move. So the centre tank is that one to the top right. And then that one's the rear tank. And then the other one is the front tank. But the centre tank is the only one that will go down as we fly. And that centre tank fuel level is replicated in more detail in a gauge just below the turn coordinator there. So again if I play with the quantity of the centre tank you'll see that going down. What you'll see is when that gets below a certain threshold you get a warning light, low fuel level and what we have to do there, and of course we don't have a low fuel level really because the other two tanks are still full to the brim. So what we have to do then is we have to transfer fuel from another tank. We do that by spinning. Let's take it from the rear tank. We, oops, that's the front tank. Switch to the rear tank. It's the first thing we do. We need to be flying straight and level, which we are. And then we need to put on the second fuel boost pump, which is the switch in the middle of the screen now. And then if we leave that just for a little while, you should see the quantity in the centre tank down here, don't forget, increase gradually. It's not increasing visibly, but we'll just leave it for a couple of minutes. And then that low fuel level light should go out in due course. There's a strip down there, I wonder what that is. It's not the one we're aiming for. We can't swoop down on it because we'll upset that straight level flight for the fuel transfer. Is that creeping up? It's hard to tell. If I put on my fuel control panel display, that actually has a digital readout of the level. So, center is. 30 centre 2, which is our centre tank for the aircraft in question, is showing 34%. Is that increasing? Am I doing something wrong? Well, we'll, let that, we'll just let that stay on the screen while we're, we're just overflying Vernonia now, where we took off from. Okay, if you just look up to the top, to the top of the screen at the minute, that digital readout showing we are we are increasing the level in the center two tanks go up to 35%. So that transfer is not rapid. Oh well, it's it's happening anyway. We should see that low fuel level light go out eventually. But for now, we'll leave that transfer going. We're going to. We're still on autopilot here. We come off autopilot. Okay, let's try for barrel field again. Well, I'm way over speeding there. That's probably going to do something nasty like rip the wings off. That's barrel below, just visible to the bottom left of the wind screen. It's almost 
difficult to make that out as an airfield. It's like a scrape on the ground. There it is in the quarter light there. So I don't think we'll try and put it down there, we'll just get into serious trouble if we do that. <laughs> that fuel transfer is proceeding, we're over 40 uh, gallons in the tank now. 40 gallons, is that right? US gallons. Okay, let's just take you back. Manual, and we'll see what it's like to put this thing down. You might notice the condition lever or the fuel cutoff lever over there on the central console has got a, a fair bit of play in it. You can't actually cut it off accidentally because there's a, a little trap there uh, and also this lever only really has two positions it has cut off and run and that that region above the run setting actually has no no effect that's authentic i understand and that's like the twin ultra extended as well is good to see around here not a whole lot so we've lost that low fuel warning light now you look down there the level's gone up to about 45 gallons still transferring we'll let that go for a little while longer now let's check out the compass and the direction indicator. Now let's see, let's go into autopilot to do that. We're going to roll mode and altitude hold, so we're straight and level. Compass is indicating 65, let's say 045. Direction indicator 045. Now that direction indicator, I believe, has two different settings. Currently it's slaved to the compass, which is excellent, like an HSI. We don't have to adjust it, but somewhere down here, I think, yeah, the no, directional gyro, slave or free, just to the right of the hob speed to that panel of switches. I don't have a switch program to do that, so I can't demonstrate that without reaching for the mouse, which I'm not going to do. So let's take her in. Let's stop that fuel transfer now. I'm not sure if that's a good idea to have that going while we're on the approach. So I'll switch off that second boost pump and we'll put the fuel selector back to off. So we're just about at the wise arc there. Let's get some flaps out. I'm reaching up for the flaps instead of down, which is why that um, view is responding. I've left this a bit too late actually. Let's go to landing flaps before we do anything else. If I just go to full flaps. Now I found this very difficult to put this down smoothly without bouncing and I, I suspect that's because we're not loaded I'm just trying to lose a bit more height here it's not uh, I'm still too high so what I might do is set this up for the next time around with a bit of a load on board 
and maybe we can put it down more smoothly but we'll try we've got quite a long strip here so we're a little bit faster than I would like to be going shouldn't be any winds right stop so we'll just let it settle from here we're going to land way long here actually I'm going to pull it gently and just let it settle on the main wheels try to hold it off there's the cones coming up see even there we bounced once we're down and the tail's down we can go oh it's not down we've got reverse thrust so there you go we stopped before the cones at least but you could see I was slow there I was gentle and I still bounced. So let's try that again. We need to unlock the tailwheel, otherwise, we're not going to be able to turn around. Let's, because uh, we've got minimal wind, we can take off in this direction. But let's just set it up with some ballast. Baggage freight. I don't know what we're allowed here, let's put in £1,000. Kind of sluggish there. Maybe that's that extra weight. Well, it will be that extra weight. There's that nose down tendency again. We will trim off as we, as we go. We're coming from the same end. Just because it's a familiar picture by now. Watching those engine gauges, don't forget, we don't want to overcook anything, blow anything up. a lot of rudder in this aircraft to keep it balanced this doesn't feel like you need a lot of rudder okay there we go so we're going to go to landing flaps Let's try and come in a little bit lower and slower this time. So we're doing 78, this is miles per hour on this. Airspeed gauge, no we're still too high really. do some fairly abrupt turns to kind of lose a bit of extra speed. Okay. So I think that's a slightly better picture than last time. But still pretty quick, pretty okay. 
Okay. So again, we want to be gentle. Just try and hold it off. Land it on the mains. Just try and keep it off. That was still. We got a bounce there. And another bounce. I think we're down now. Tailwind on the ground, reverse. Well, it was a lot shorter than before. Unlock the tailwheel. certainly need to play with that and do a lot of practicing on, until we can get that down. Uh, maybe I'm going too fast. I was following pretty sure what it says in the manual about approach speed. There's some checklists towards the back of the manual. But maybe we need to be coming in slower than that. Nice little like playing there. What else do we have? Cessna of some sort, another Cessna over there. So I think we'll just leave it here for now. Before you can pull the cut off, you've got to get that little guard out of the way on the condition lever. Got a button for that as well. There we go. So that's the turbo otter from Milvis. A nice little aeroplane with a fair bit of depth, particularly if you take on the challenge of learning about the autopilot and indeed the weather radar. So it's a much better simulation all round, really, of the turboprop engine. Not a fantastically in-depth simulation, but in terms of flyability and responsiveness, far outshines the turboprop model built into P3D or into FSX. And even so, it's a difficult aircraft to fly and put down precisely into these little strips. So, um, yeah, I think we'll be spending a bit more time with this, so watch out for some more videos coming up.